If you were reading along through the Gospel of John, and you heard at this point Jesus say, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, a part of you would go, oh, now we find out what it is that he's actually talking about. Because all through the Gospel of John, Jesus, things would happen and Jesus would say, my hour is not yet come. And he says that actually with no explanation and sort of, and so you're left with, what's he mean? What's his hour? What is, what is he talking about? Which is, I'm sure, the experience of those who were listening to him make those comments as he began to go through his life. But now, something new has taken place. The sign, of course, is the hunger of the Gentiles. The Greeks say, we wish to see Jesus. The shift has happened. The spiritual balance of the world is beginning to move in a direction that reveals something new. And the newness is Jesus as Messiah, not just for his own people, but literally the whole world. So that what results is a kingdom that looks like every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation. But Jesus does more than say his hour has come. He describes what's going to happen in it. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And again, to the shock and the surprise of many, Glorification looks like death. It's death that is the place where the Son of Man is glorified. Saying something clear about the very nature and character of God, that the glorification of God is actually expressed in humility, in sacrifice. And that the very outflowing of God's glory, to quote the book of Hebrews, is seen supremely in betrayal, bruising, beating, suffering, and death. That's how the very nature and character of God is supremely expressed. And in fact, the center of it really is the cross of Christ. The resurrection is the outworking, the natural, logical conclusion to what we see in the cross. But it is the cross that is, in fact, the supreme expression of his glory. It, it's a mistake, in other words, for people to say, why do Christians wear crosses around their neck? They ought to have empty tombs. No, there's something in the cross itself that in fact expresses the very nature of God. It is not mere triumphalism, in other words. It is instead a sacrificial life best expressed in death that God chooses to raise up in triumph, saying amen to the sacrifice of Jesus, to his life. In other words, if you want to put it this way, in the end Jesus says, you know, the Father will honor those who follow him. The resurrection is the statement of the Father honoring the death of Jesus, his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. But you see, Jesus doesn't just use this as a way to define what's going to be happening to him rapidly at this point. But he, he expands it. He makes it, in fact, a spiritual principle, a spiritual principle that, in fact, directly is applied to his fathers, his followers. Unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Not only defining the outworking of his own death and resurrection, but also saying, you know, if you want to be one of my followers, this is the path to which you are called as well. Which is why Jesus goes on to say, he who hates his life will lose it, but he who, is, who loses his life for my sake will find it. The word life not meaning body, but instead meaning the very essence of who we are. 
that self that in fact wants to live life on its own terms. That self that wants life to go, in my case, my way. That's the self from which we choose to part company. From which, to which we say to God, Lord, I can't deal with this rebellious so-and-so that lives inside of me. I, I want you to come and conquer it. Because this, this self, because it is the self, it is far bigger than any efforts I might make to try to control it. And in fact, in the end, self is not displaced by personal coercion. Sure, we can look and say, okay, here's the, the job description and I want to find a way to live it out. That's actually what we get in the Thessalonian reason, reading. Pray without ceasing, rejoice always. It's a job description. It is, in fact, the outward expression of a life that is learning to die and live out, living out the power of the resurrection. But self actually is conquered not through coercion, but by displacement. The displacement of another, with a capital A. In other words, displacement happens, and really that's what we're asking for, is for the Holy Spirit to come in and build into us the life of Jesus. That my efforts to somehow um, express some level of self-control only goes so far, and I am inevitably dashed upon the rocks of my own desire to do what I want, even to my own self-destruction. That's the nature, the seductive power of sin, is that the very thing that could kill the good is often the thing that we deeply desire. And therefore, God has to come in. God has to come in and is express his death and resurrection that gives us, in fact, the power to both be changed and to say no to that which expresses this he who would hate his life will find it. It's an expression of God's work that, in fact, has to happen. Has to happen. If we are, in fact, going to live in any way that reflects the life of Jesus. And that is the life to which we are called. So, how does all this relate to Henry Budd? Well, pretty clearly. Henry Budd, Canadian, the very first First Nation person ever ordained within the Anglican Episcopal tradition. We don't even know when he was born. That's what life was like among those who kept records of uh, First Nation people in the western part of Canada, which is where he lived. All we know is the date of his ordination, which is today, which is why we commend it. Henry Cree suffered, I mean, Henry Budd, a member of the Cree Nation, who was in fact sent back to the Cree Nation to evangelize, to build schools, to win souls for Christ, and did so, and did so at high personal cost, because you see, he was mixed race. He wasn't fully Native American, nor was he Anglo. And when you're a mixed race person, you don't exactly quite fit in in anybody's culture. You're always seen as one step away. And plus, because of the racism that was even present within the Church Missionary Society that commissioned him at the time, he was paid close to half of his Anglo counterparts in other parts of Canada. And yet, in the midst of all of that, people were won to Christ. Hospitals, schools, lives were changed because there was something about his character, this is what people said, that reflected the things that he spoke of and taught and therefore they knew him to be real. That's, you see, our calling. We are not promised a fair shot in life. We are not promised as Christians.
to always get what we want. We are not promised as Christians even temporal happiness. What we are promised is sacrifice. What we are promised is the joy of God's life flowing through us in a way that in fact changes the lives of other people. Some of which we see, some of which we don't. And so what we're committing ourselves to again and again, and even here, in the receiving of the Eucharist, in the reaffirmation of our own vows with those who are being confirmed, is a willingness to say yes to his life over mine. That's, that's really the meaning of this. <laughs> Me saying, here it is. And God responding in great love, even in the imperfection, and even our efforts to try to manipulate God through our prayers to get what we want. Him still saying, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Mm -hmm. And giving us his life. That's Henry Budd. That's the essence of confirmation. That's the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And out of that, we say today, even, yes, and thank you, God, that you gave everything for us. And out of that, as best we know how, in great patience, God receives our yeses. Amen. Amen.